Okay, good morning, everybody, um, and those that are uh, online joining us. Uh, my name is Andrew, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Space Institute. Um, I've counted the number of uh, talks or the space catch-ups that we had since we relaunched it. This is our sixth space catch-up, so lucky six. Um, and today we have a, a special guest speaker, uh, uh, Professor John, uh, that will be speaking to us. But before I begin, I'd like to uh, uh, do the acknowledgement to country. Uh, you know, I pay my respects to the Runji people on which Swinburne's campuses is uh, uh, laying on and also where uh, we are gathered today, um, you know, acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so the monthly space catch up is intended to be you know, face to face, we will slowly transit to face to face. But today we have sort of a hybrid mode whereby, you know, some of, the, some of you are uh, online joining us, but I do encourage you to uh, come down to the Swinburne campuses. We are fully open and we would love to uh, have a cup of tea with you and discuss the opportunities in space. Uh, I'm going to hand over the mic to one of our program leaders and also uh, Peter who has kindly invited John to give the short introduction. So um, looking forward to the talk, gentlemen. Here you go. Peter. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners on the lands in which we meet. Um, my respects to their elders past, present uh, and emerging. My name is Peter Moore. I head up the Space Instrumentation Engineering Group. Uh, really looking forward to this presentation. Um, from John LaMarshall, um, I think a, another couple of people I'd like to recognise here who we're working with currently on some of this technology that John will present. We have uh, Bob Wright and Gary Quinn from ASS WeatherTech, great Australian company here in Richmond. Uh, we're currently working on a project, hyperspectral microwave sounders, uh, ground-based initially, but we'd like to get it up into space at some stage, and that's been sponsored by the uh, SmartSat CRC. So uh, we're looking forward to... Uh, extending that work and, and the outcomes of that. So I'd just like to provide a short background to uh, Professor John LaMarshall. He uh, began his career when he was awarded a PhD in physics from Manish University in 1972, and later a diploma of meteorology, 1974. Over his career, he has held positions at the Bureau of Meteorology, the Centre for National Deatwit Spatial, University of Wisconsin and the Joint Centre for Satellite Data Assimilation, amongst others. Professor John LaMarshall is an adjunct professor at RMIT University and has held adjunct professorships at the School of Mathematics, University of New South Wales, 2001, the School of Physics, La Trobe University, 2002, and the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, University of Wisconsin, 2005. He is a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, 2010, and a fellow of the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society 2014. So without any further ado, I'd uh, like to hand over the presentation of the session, Six De Decades of Satellite Meteorology from Cloud Picture Interpretation to Hyperspectral Infrared and Microwave Sounding. So thank you, John. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, I I've worked, as you can see on the screen, from um, 1972 to 2022, uh, effectively worked at the Bureau and um, was director of the NASA, NOAA and Department of Defense Joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation um, for five years um, between 2003 and 2007. Um, the major task there was bringing in the AIRS, AIRS instrument, the first hyperspectral operational satellite. Um, I'm briefly going to you know, give an introduction uh, and go through the history which involves image interpretation um, and sounding from space, wind estimation, use of this data in NWP, numerical weather prediction, the impact on uh, forecasts and the preparation for an advanced Australian satellite and then summarize it. <clears throat> I go right back to the beginning. I think um, I've got a chart here from 1861, which is about the earliest one that's easy to find. 
And this shows the density of observations over the Southern Oceans in 1861. But to be able to draw this chart, you've probably got to wait for years afterwards, go through all the ship's logs, get the observations and draw a chart and then you know something about the Southern Oceans, which is not so much good for tomorrow's forecast. Um, so if you jump right through then to the 31st of March, 1960, you can actually see here, um, the, these are some um, flimsies I copied from um, NMLC, NMC, Bob, this could be one of yours. These are the operational flimsies they did, and I photocopied them, but they show there's not much increase in data over the oceans, a little bit, um, there's probably a little bit more over the land. And what would happen is, Bob will tell you, people would draw the charts of what they had, but they'd then say if they had an observation in Western Australia, they'd go back to the charts earlier and redo the charts earlier so they were consistent with what was, was happening now. But it was pretty hard to do a forecast with this sort of coverage and not being able to see what was happening out to sea with the, where the lows were and so on. So look, there are a heap of events that actually change the way we do things. Um, Parent and Sumi um, produced a radiometer in um, uh, Wisconsin, and, and that was flown in 59, and that was a radiation experiment. But the first weather satellite was Taros 1, flew in 1960, and then the satellites had automatic picture transmission after 63, so the weather services got images, could see what was coming. Then in 69, the first sounder was flown. Um, uh, the SIRS A and A channel uh, infrared sounder. Then we went through a series of sounders and we ended up with, say, um, by 1972, um, an infrared and then a microwave sounder. And the advantage of the microwave is the infrared, you look really good where there's no cloud, but when you have cloud, unfortunately, you, the sensing stops at the cloud top. So the microwave allows you to go through that and get complete coverage. Um, in 76, GMS-1 was launched and we started to get continuous imagery every hour or so. Now we're getting 10 minute imagery. Um, then in 78, there was hers and a microwave sounder, so you could see through the clouds. Um, then there was a, a sounder on GOES-4 back in 78, so there's a sounder on the GEO that will continuously. I spent part of my youth working on data from that and showing you could improve tropical cyclone forecasts with it, but it wasn't funded again. And there was a funding of an imager in 94 and then it didn't really start until um, in this uh, century. Um, the, uh, I guess the, the, big, uh, the latest change, or one of the latest changes with ATOBs, which went from um, a, to a 20 channel infrared and 20 channel microwave instrument, the big change to hyperspectral instruments was um, AIRS in 2002, where we went from uh, 20 channels to 2,378. Then Cosmic One, which used GPS signals to limb sound the Earth. Um, flotillas of uh, satellites were launched to do that. That was a, a sounding satellite that's very important. And just recently, the Aeolus has been launched, and that's a Doppler wind LIDAR, which is um, now flying. And, and that's a that um, is a prelude to what will be flown in the future. <clears throat> well, here are the boys at Goddard putting together Tyros 1, the first satellite. There it was, there's launched, it's actually April Fool's Day, April, uh, April the 1st, 1960. And the Bureau pretty quickly got some ground, ground stations um, readouts into position. And so this is a picture from Christmas Day, 1964. And you can see a, um, a low out here to the uh, west of Victoria and the frontal band uh, approaching the coast. And without satellites, you, you wouldn't sort of know that. You wouldn't know be able to analyze that or know it was coming. And you can even see bushfires and bushfire smoke here. Now, after the Bureau put ground stations, they put them in Melbourne and subsequently, you know, uh, Perth, Darwin, and so on. They could then mosaic the images, and the forecasters had these these to go with to help with their forecast, and look for areas severe weather uh, and and uh, etc. And <clears throat> they could also use these in the analysis. And then at the same time, the US started to transmit mosaic images via an old geostationary satellite that sat out off the off the um, just to the uh, uh, east of Queensland. 
I think they use that because that way they didn't have to pay anyone to transmit the data. They sent it from meteorological geo to geo and then down in Australia. So we're always, we're always a frugal group at the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, <clears throat> so how did, how did they draw it? Before you run a forecast, you need an analysis. How did they do the analysis in the early days? Well, the data was basically GTS and F analysis from Suitland. And they, in fact, the first lot of those were printed out and hand colored by meteorologists with colored pens to sort of get an idea of the cloud. But that's probably even before your time, Bob. <laughs> and I think the, um, and then after that, the NEF analyses, like you saw before, were, were transmitted through ATS1. And then <clears throat> the methods that were developed, and they were probably developed to a, a stronger extent in, in Australia for Southern Hemisphere meteorology um, than anywhere. Um, Dave Martin noticed you could actually determine the temperature trace to some extent from the cloud type. And then John Zillman, who was probably one of the most illustrious directors of meteorology in Australia, was head of WMO, related the deviations from mean sea level pressure um, from climatology to just the cloud type. And then Leon Geimer, another fellow, um, related the thousand to five thickness as a height but halfway through the atmosphere effectively. Um, to cloud type as well. So he could get the climatological deviations in that. And then Jack Langford and Bob Faulkner well, then broke up the lower slab into to thicknesses for various levels. So I had a temperature structure through there. And Bob Seaman did the same thing for the upper level. So with those methods combined together, they could actually compose a meteorological analysis through the atmosphere. And that was used with the convention, any other data, aeroplane data and other data to provide a, an analysis from which forecasts were run. And <clears throat> so I guess that what I'm saying is that when I first joined the Bureau, any, anyone who was a, a trained meteorologist should have been, was able to look at this picture and he had surface, surface observations where the red dots are and upper air observations where the green ones are. And he could actually draw and do an analysis, end up with an analysis of the whole atmosphere. And um, for instance, um, when he looked at this region down here, he was able to say, okay, this is a low pressure system of the uh, front. So the low is down here. And then he could actually look at the clouds, the type of uh, Baynard cells and so on. And he knew what deviation from climatology the thousand to five thickness would have. And he could basically infer enough to put together analysis of this region using both the cloud images and the, um, the, the, the data we had in hand from over the land and island stations. And th this technique actually supported numerical weather prediction in the early days. And even in the seventies, we were like, big centres like the European Centre, which had a lot more money and more staff and bigger computing, they couldn't do better than us in the Southern Hemisphere because we had the people who construct the, um, the analyses with um, a little more skill. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, who were the people who actually um, changed things? I guess the pioneers. There was Gene King who proposed if you scanned through the atmosphere with varying angles, you could work out the temperature profile. But the one mostly used is uh, Lou Kaplan's idea that if you look at the radiation coming out, out of the atmosphere in a number of channels, you can infer the temperature profile and the moisture profile. So Dave Walk in 1969 was actually responsible for the um, uh, SERS instrument, an eight channel instrument on, um, that was flown then. And on the same uh, spacecraft, um, Nimbus 3, Rudy Hanau actually put an uh, interferometer back in those days, right up. He was years before his time. And in fact, people ask, often ask the question, why didn't they go with the interferometer? I guess the, the grading spectrometer was easy and less channels. <coughs> Excuse me. And the, the way it worked was um, comparatively simple. If you look here at the wave number, the, the, the frequency of the channels, and the channels to say uh, the instrument that they walk flew one to eight are marked here on the, on the system. And you actually pick a channel like um, channel three, you can see that over here we have a thing called the weighting function, which tells you where the energy measured in channel three um, comes from in the atmosphere. And you can see from here, most of the energy, the peak comes from, you know, I guess, um, 300, around 300 hectopascals. 
but you're sampling, you're getting radiation from 600 to right up towards the top of the atmosphere. So each of these channels actually gives you a measurement of the, um, the temperature within this, underneath these weighting functions. And the trick is you have to take the measurements in each of these weighting functions and uh, sort of, um, I guess, unscramble the egg and end up with a temperature profile, a moisture profile. And, um, and, and as I said, here's Rudy Hanau's interferometer. It gave continuous measurements, but it's only been recently that they've decided to use, gone back to the interferometer. So when they took those eight channels of data uh, from Dave Walk's um, instrument, they could invert them and got temperature profiles and they fitted closely to the radio sound, as you see here, they're pretty good. Um, so uh, <clears throat> better than you'd probably expect with the vertical resolution of the instrument. Then, excuse me. <clears throat> then back in the early days, um, just after the satellite was launched, Bill Smith and Hal Wolf and some other people um, sat down, took the data and put it into the numerical weather prediction scheme. And I'm not going to go through and talk about how it's changed the analysis and the fact that it made an improvement in this, the first published um, impact study. But what I'll say is they also, when they first got their first um, running of the, the processing system, they took it straight to NMC in Washington. And they went into the people on shift there, and this is so we worked this closely in Melbourne, or we went straight into the people on shift and showed them the analysis of the upper air. The interesting thing was on the eastern part of the Pacific, the um, there was a jet stream that wasn't helpful to aviation. So when they looked at it and knew what they had in their analysis, they said straight away, these planes are going to have to put down for fuel because then when you flew across the Pacific. You had to, um, or, or when you flew um, you know, a, 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 uh, across the Pacific, you had to be aware. Uh, the winds determined whether you get there in one hit or, or refuel. Anyway, because of this and because the information was clearly useful, uh, what happened was the um, head of the shift and the people at NMC said, how long before this could be operational? He, said, he was silly enough to say six weeks, but they actually did it in six weeks, but, but things progressed reasonably quickly. And I can say that's sort of the way things work here in the Bureau too. It's sort of, um, um, yeah, it's often that interaction between research and the people, the operational users is pretty important. Okay, now the satellite sounding in Australia, I guess in the mid to late 1970s, we used um, data coming over the global telecommunication system from Washington, we used temperature profiles derived from satellite. And latest we, later we used clear radiances and did our own um, retrievals of temperature and moisture. And then we were involved in impact, early impact study with Nimbus 6, which was um, an, adva an advanced sounder for that day. And then uh, from the 1980s onwards, we were the first country to actually have direct readout of the um, operational satellites. From about 83 onwards, we directly read data down in this country, processed it. And I think we were the first country outside the US to actually put that directly into our operational system. And people were keen to do it, they were motivated to do it because it made a big difference in the quality of our analyses and forecasts. So we moved pretty quickly in that area, um, the early 80s. Okay, so how does the Bureau use this sort of data now? Well, forecasters use visible and infrared and water vapor and microwave products. Um, to produce color enhanced satellite images to generate volcan volcanic ash products. They use them to detect tropical cyclones and look at the intensity of them. Um, there are a lot of image related applications. I'll show you a slide with a list in a second. Then for numerical weather predictions, um, it, the key areas are temperature and humidity sounding where they use infrared and microwave polar orbiting satellite data. Um, and for, for uh, sounding, we also use GPS, the GPS signal for radio occultation. So, so a little bit about that. And then for wind, we use scatterometers, radiometers, Doppler wind LIDARs. And the biggest uh, contributor of wind data is um, satellite derived atmospheric motion vectors. And what they do is look at images from the satellite in any a number of frequencies, like typically if you generate three or four data sets or four data sets. And what you do is identify features in one image and find them in the next image so you know how far they've gone, you've got the speed. 
and then you can analyze the temperature of the cloud. So if that's what you're doing, you can get the height. So they make a big impact and we set that up early in 92. Um, so there's basically, ideally for a, an analysis, you, you, you know, ideally you'd like to have a hundred data streams of, of data, not a hundred satellites, but a hundred data streams. And there are other things like vegetation index, grassland curing, solar radiation, all useful products for the community that we must do. Now the image data, just to give you some of the applications of image data, I've just got a page full here and you can look at it later on, but I'm not gonna go through snow cover, rainfall estimation and so on, but there are a large number of applications. And a number of satellites, look, there are tens of satellites here on the equator. The US have um, three geo satellites, the Japanese have two, South Koreans have one and so on. You can go through, so there are tens of satellites on, in geo orbit around the Earth, some with sounding capability, and there are also several tens of polar orbiting satellites providing data. So there is a lot of uh, data available for meteorology. I can spend the rest of the talk going through it, but I'm not. Um, okay, so typically, uh, what are, what's being assimilated in um, the sta ad average state of the art um, numerical um, weather prediction? Um, system typically you use the first two on top there AMSU A and AMSU B uh, basically um, 20 channel microwave sounders they're actually and some um, they're, they're very important to the analysis they're an important instrument the next one is AIRS uh, which, which is um, near, nearing the, or the end of its, nearing the end of its life it was launched um, 2002 it went for um, quite a long has gone for quite a long time, has 2,372 channels. On Meadow Bay, you've got more AMSU instruments, plus IASI, another hyperspectral infrared. And I can go through this, but there are large numbers of um, uh, sounders and um, uh, geo satellites which provide winds, um, providing data for the system. As, as I said, if you, if you put the full list up, you can spend all day going through the lot. But there are, as I said, you could basically use 50 or 60 data streams without any problem at all. In terms of numerical weather prediction, where you put these data, um, the data go into a global model, um, about uh, 12 kilometer resolution. And in these little capital city models, um, which are 1.5 kilometer resolution in analysis, uh, in um, not an analysis, in prediction. And, and there's also a tropical cyclone model, which is movable and, and can be used as well. Now, this will surprise you. The, the, the importance of, if you look at the importance of Earth observations from space in the Southern Hemisphere, in Southern Hemisphere, space-based observations extend the life of a high quality numerical forecast by a factor of four. That's when you verify against an analysis done with all the data. So what, what does that mean? If you, and I'll give you another way. If you go over here, and this, this anomaly correlation is a correlation between the forecast at 24 hours and the verifying analysis. And so that's 500 hectopascals. And that's a standard way of gauging the, the um, accuracy of a forecast. If you go, um, if you look here, you can see at 24 hours, the anomaly correlation um, for Southern Hemisphere forecasts without satellite data is 0.9. Then if you go right across here, you can see that the anomaly correlation reaches 0.9, the, the forecast accuracy degrades to 0.9 with satellite, using satellite data after four days. So the people in the Northern Hemisphere are paying for all these satellites, they get, as I'll show you, they get a little, some benefit, but we get four days. It, it goes from one to four days. When, when I first showed this, people didn't believe it, didn't believe it. And we actually did this with um, both the Australian numerical weather prediction system, as well as that we used the US weather prediction system. And if you go, the, the results here for the Southern Hemisphere are basically, again, 24 hours to 96 hours, the same quality forecast, one without and one with satellite data. So that's with another modeling system. So the people from NASA say it's got to be true because it's, you know, get the same result from two, two systems. But if you go here and look at the Southern Hemisphere, you can see the quality of a forecast 
without satellite data in the southern hemisphere of 24 hours is about not even um, um, three days, not even the same quality as a three day for, as not as um, about the quality of a three day forecast. So instead of getting four times the length, you get sort of half or, or less than one. So it's interesting, people in the Northern Hemisphere think satellites are vital because they improve the forecast by a significant amount. But the, compared to what happens in the Southern Hemisphere, um, they're not that, um, it's not that big. Okay, well, I'll go through quickly now. This shows you that if you look at a rainfall event, a 48 to 72 hour forecast over Victoria, um, done with satellite data, you look at without satellite data where the heavy rain disappears. And if you look at the just the rain gauge verification where the rain gauge is ever used to verify, you can see the heavy rain only falls in this case. It's only one case, but the, co the correlation uh, between observed and forecast rainfall with no satellite data is 0.28 and with it 6.9. And if you look at a whole month, the, the, the improvements are you know, really significant. There's no, there's no doubt for the geophysical parameters you get the same, um, you get those, uh, you get those big improvements from the satellite data. Okay, the next thing I was going to show you was give you an idea of how much contribution each instrument makes to the analysis in terms of removing the uh, errors in a 20, error reduction in a 24 hour forecast. Now, um, I guess the top, the top ranking on this is usually, um, either AMSU or one of the uh, one of the microwave instruments or one of the hyperspectral infrared instruments, and you can see if you have a hyperspectral microwave, you're going to be looking pretty good. <laughs> but uh, the um, so what this says is the the ASI is the most impactful. This is for a, over a period of three months in 2016. Um, Yazi was the most impactful, the hyperspectral infrared, followed by AMSU, the microwave, then AMVs, and then radio sound. So you can see the satellites dominate the actual quality of the, the analysis and the forecast. Um, if you go over to this side and you see how now there's like there's hundreds of thousands or millions of AMVs often in, in a um, in a period. But if, if you go over here and look at the impact of the individual lobs, well, floating buoys have the biggest impact, but there's not many of them, but they're out in the ocean and there's, the, there's no other data. So while these have significant impacts um, um, per observation, the big hitters in the analysis of the satellite data. So first of all, I'm just going to look at some of the different satellites that we've, um, we've got. The hyperspectral infrared sounders are here. Their airs with 2,378 channels, the first of them that went on for about 20 years. And then there's Yazi with 8,400, an interferometer, and then another interferometer, the Chris, which is 1305. And before, when I showed you um, the this, SERS this instrument and showed you the weighting functions, there are eight of them. But you can see here with a hyperspectral satellite. There are thousands of them. So well, here you've got samples of the temperature under each of these weighting functions effectively. And the trick is then to unscramble the egg, but you've got a lot more um, information there and the results are, are a lot better. This shows you, if you do a simulation, basically, if you're looking at retrieving temperature, you find if you use um, 18 channels, you probably get in the synthetic, um, calculation, you get about an RMS error of 1.8 degrees. If you have 3,200, you get about 0.8. So the, the number of channels makes a big difference. And in doing water vapor, the same thing, the water vapor accuracy is also improved by more channels, more is better. So I was encouraged in um, the early 2000s to go and work at the Joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation. The main, the main reason there was air, airs had been built been put into the sky, but unfortunately the impact on operational forecasting from an instrument, which has probably cost between 400 and 600,000, a lot of, you know, it was the first of the hyperspectral, so it had to pay a lot of things the next lot didn't have to pay. Um, so the impact was, um, you know, not that large and part of the job was I had three years to solve the problem. 
but we're, we were lucky by taking all of the observations and just working systematically through it, changing the way the data was actually used, using more, uh, more data on the ground, using the um, short wave data at night and uh, a, a number a considerable number of changes we actually um, managed to get impact from the air's instrument and what, what was expected you expect to get this is sort of a really significant change this is compatible the improvement in anomaly correlation the red one with opera, um, operations plus airs us operational system plus airs is equivalent to um, a couple of years or a few years of development of the model and the whole system. You made it in one hit. So it was a sort of, um, and the impacts look bigger. That's the surface. If you go to mid atmosphere, they're bigger as well. And that was the Southern Hemisphere and that's the Northern Hemisphere. The other good thing was it was first published in the Australian Meteorological Magazine. So, so people coming to, coming to Australia to, um, um, see the results and anyway so that was um very good because it um was important for the americans to actually get the thing up get it running and demonstrate it because people were talking about the large amount of money spent on the instrument and maybe it would have been better making the numerical model a larger model anyway so, so we um we sort of managed to get that done first and um, showed exactly what the hyperspectral could do at the same time, while I was in the US, um, this GPS system, the Joint Set had to put this um, new cosmic radio occultation flotilla in, into operations and, um, and, and do it in reasonably quick time. We were the first um, group to sort of get the, this system into an operational uh, forecast model and show impact. But basi basically, um, you have a series of um, LEO satellites going around here receiving GPS signals. And um, what happens is as the um, satellite um, uh, um, occludes, goes behind the Earth, sets, um, then if you know the bending angle here and you have all the um, GPS information, time and position and so on, if you know all of that, you can actually calculate um, uh, the refractive index or effectively temperature. Um, um, in the atmosphere here. So you can basically do a sounding using the, with the radio, I mean, the um, GPS transmitters, which is a significant number, and there's now groups, ones with each country. So this is sort of the, the sheep, the uh, people who did the radio occultation first went out to show why we should do it. And basically, um, the reason is it's complementary to the, the hyperspectral sounders that he used in, in a way that the GPS um, radio occultation has very high vertical resolution, but poor horizontal resolution. That's because of the way it sounds. And whereas the um, normal sounders are the other way around. But the, another advantage of it is that the um, this one doesn't need tuning or calibration because it's a raw calculation. You've got times and distances and position, and it's you know, straight measurement. You don't have the, the tuning problems you have with um, um, th thermal satellite instruments. And basically to, to show you these are complementary, the um, red line here is a normalized error for radio occultation. So you see the error is big near the surface, um, reduces from the mid uh, troposphere up. And whereas the hyperspectral sounders tend to be better near the ground and then have a problem when they get up near the tropopause. Uh, and you can see from the blue one, when you put them both together, you have the best of both worlds. So every modern data assimilation system really needs to have both components. And now there are more and more um, of these radio occultation satellites putting up um, in, in the system. Okay, where am I? Okay, so when I came back to Australia after being at the Joint Centre, I grabbed the cosmic data, which wasn't um, um, uh, there at that stage in operations. And we got cosmic data, grace data, and met up data, put them into our global forecast model. That's the sort of extra data we got per day in terms of soundings. And whether, whether you look at anomaly correlation or just RMS errors, you can see at the surface, um, MSLP, halfway up the atmosphere, 500, 
or uh, at the top of the atmosphere in the Australian region, the, the red, the, um, that using GPS radio occultation, the forecast is better. And if you actually look at, um, yeah, and, and the story continues right through. If you look at um, the Australian region here and the Southern Hemisphere here, it doesn't matter whether you look at the whole hemisphere or Australia, adding the radio occupation data gives improvement at, at all levels, at all, all time periods. So it was a no brainer. Now that was done using um, refractivity data. Um, if you change and use the bending, bending angle data, that means you can take the data out of the processing system before you have to make assumptions about the atmosphere that the, probably the Weather Bureau could do better because you've got all the meteorological data there up to date all the time. When you put in bending angle and go through and do the same um, impact studies, again, you've got the same result at all levels and didn't matter whether you looked at the Southern Hemisphere or, or Australia, you still got an improvement um, from using the radio occultation data. So in the end, the Bureau is now, and all, nearly all of weather services are now using bending angle in their processing, and it's become an important part of the, uh, the system. And this will give you an example of when I said about uh, helping to calibrate the, uh, the system. This, this is a, a picture from 2006 of the ECMWF analysis temperature at 100 hectopascals. And you can see, compared to the radio sound, it's got a bias of nearly half a degree, 0.3 or 0.4 of a degree. When they turned on radio occultation, uh, when the system started to carry radio occultation, because it has no biases, you can see putting that data into the mix actually tunes the model down. And if you're using it for things like climate change or using it to, to, be, um, to be accurate, you, you can see that um, actual adding radio occultation data um, makes the analyses, um, you know, tunes them and makes them um, better, um, better for measuring things like changing temperature at sort of climate change scales. Okay, and when they did that, the ECMWF, before we talked about how impactful the um, different we talk about how impactful the different sound or different uh, instruments were, and they found that all the systems in it, uh, they were using all the observations, uh, the, the cosmic and, and metop uh, GPS RO bending data were about the, the um, fifth most impactful. You see behind AMSU is number one with them, hyperspectral infrared, the next two, and then um, air reps and followed by GPS RO. But you can see again, satellites play a really um, dominating role in, in the system. Okay. In summary, cosmic grace met up radio occultation data. I'm not going to go through, it, I've given the summary as I go. Okay, so you probably thought that's the end of GPS. Uh, we're, we're done with that. Well, the other thing that happens is here you're using GPS for doing temperature soundings by occultation. The other thing is you can get a bit more value out of the GPS network, which is satellites, which there's a large number. You can actually receive the data and the zenith total delay in the signal coming to the ground is dependent on the moisture in the atmosphere. So you can actually measure the total moisture in the atmosphere effectively by using zenith total delay. And it turns out there are um, GPS receivers all over Australia. So this is a really good way of um, doing, uh, doing it for two reasons. One is someone's already put hundreds and hundreds of um, receivers out there and wired them in. So that's already already done. And there are, um, and the network is getting bigger. So at that stage, we formed a partnership with RMIT and Rockslav University in uh, Poland and Geoscience Australia. That way we could have two redundant systems, which you, you always like to have, a bit of backup. And we basically, um, took uh, calculated the zenith total delay and then assimilated into the and assimilated into the access model now i'm not going to go through this except say when you look at the expression for ztd total delay it's just um, 
the integral of the refractive index dz, and then there's um, in here is the water vapor density. So effectively, you can get a measure of the total water vapor by just taking um, these um, um, satellite to ground measurements. And the advantage, one of the, the big advantages of these data is that by just wiring up the system right back at the, at the start, um, we had 256 ground stations straight away. And Australia is building to 700 because for precision ag agriculture, and position positioning, which people always want to have, there there'll be about seven hundred. There's about seven hundred now, which this system will get. And as they add more, you get more data for free. So it's um, it's really been a, a great thing. And the Victorian government and New South Wales government and a lot of people have cooperated with us on this because they like to see the data having a second use. I mean, this as well as positioning, it's also um, does something for the, for the forecast. Okay, so the processing was done by two techniques. I'm not going to go into double differencing and um, or with geoscience precise point positioning. Both produced data uh, of quality for the numerical weather prediction system. The RMIT data at the moment might be a little, a little bit ahead, but it's um, GA is just about to update some of their positioning. So it, it's they're both produced good data and if you want some detail it's been, been published in JSH in 2020 and you can get more detail about it there. So when we had the data we then decided we'd have to uh, we started to test it and one of the tests was uh, say for instance to put into the uh, capital city model over Victoria the 1.5 kilometer model and to um, and, and to set up their access 4D bar system to use and the um, ZTD data is all generated in real time. It's updated, the moisture data at every station is updated every 20 minutes, and it all flows automatically. It all, you know, just process, processes at the um, RMIT GA, comes down the line, goes through, goes through the security into the bureau, and then goes into, into the system. And, you know, th there's no other data source like it. It's a, a winner before you press the button to see what happens. So basically, the, this, this capital city model over Victoria was used. All the data, all the uh, surface aircraft, sonde and profile data, Doppler winds, um, all the rest, all, all the usual uh, database for actually operational database we used with this data. And the system was run uh, between the 29th of November, 4th of December. And I could figure out a terrific image that shows you what a fantastic forecast it is with it and not without, but one forecast doesn't mean a lot. But I'll give you an idea of the scale of change. Here you can see we've got these two dashes. This is basically the um, 50 millimetre contour. And you can see it's not far from Port Phillip Bay. When you put this data into the um, system, and as I said, we're looking at 24-hour rainfall between... Um, up to the 2nd of the 12th, 2007 at 00Z. You can see if you put no ZTD data into the system, the, the, the same contour is well removed from um, Portfield Bay. I mean, the rainfall's too far to the northeast. And when you actually add this, uh, the data to the operational system, um, and as I said, se several hundred of um, observations every um, um, 20 minutes, you can see that this dub, this contour here is, is moved more back to where it should be. That's to give you an idea of how you can actually change the, where the rainfall's fallen and gives you an idea of its significant changes. And then they measure the accuracy of forecasts using the fraction skill score. You know, the, the bigger the skill score, the better it is. And this shows uh, and this gives you a measure of how good is at different scales at a 10 grid scale, you know, say 14 kilometer resolution as opposed to 28 kilometer resolution. It tells you how grainy you can get accurate forecasts. But what this shows is if you use ZTD data, um, you, you get a better um, a rainfall forecast, or a better rainfall forecast than not using ZTD data, say with 12 hour forecast or 18 hour forecast. So it's pretty comprehensive. It, it, it's sort of uh, 
I mean, the fact is, you, effectively, these satellites can measure the total reciprocal water to within a few millimetres, which is as good as a radio sonde or better. So if you put this into the model and it doesn't improve the moisture analysis, you've got to work out what you're doing wrong. So it was sort of, so this, so that, that went into operations and it also it didn't go as a major project because you could do it without having to bother too many people because someone else did the calculation and the data was sent to the Bureau and it used existing uh, forecast models and all the rest. The other, the other big observation type that's um, important for meteorology is winds. And what we do is say, take these cloud images and we get features in, in the clouds and we, um, we track them from image to image, look at the correlation between the features as you go along. And then we generate you know, millions of winds that way. And we do it in the visible, infrared and water vapor. And we had the first fully automatic AMV system anywhere in the world uh, back in 92. And the reason was because Leon Geimer actually said, if this, uh, if this takes one more man on shift, this is not going operational. So we, we were forced to sort of automate it completely. And then we started assimilating hourly data um, in 1996. I think ECMWF didn't do it to 2010. So we moved along pretty quickly. And even we um, error, put accurate error estimates or regional error estimates on our winds back in 2004 were the first to sort of do that. Anyway, we generate winds, continuous winds in the infrared, visible, and the water vapor. Um, the water vapor can be get winds in clear areas, and they go into our operational system. The reason we use them is if you add these winds, um, you reduce the RMS errors in the forecast. So that's why we've, we've done it since um, the early 90s without stop. Um, with uh, the satellite system at the moment, what we do is different than others is we actually generate every wind we possibly can from every image. And this is just doing, doing a calculation once an hour and this is doing it every possible time. You up the uh, number of um, um, winds. And we also do say visible and infrared because these winds here, the, the beige ones uh, are infrared, um, are visible, sorry, and the, these are the infrared. You can see you need to have winds taken from images with the two different frequencies. Uh, you need both of them to get the circulations right. So we do that. And the RMS errors of our winds are as good as, if you compare these to the ones um, done internationally, they, they do quite well. But the, the main reason is we actually accurately calculate the error of each wind. And we work, we, we decide that if the wind, we don't think the, error, if the errors in the winds are better than the, uh, Error, smaller than the error in the background of the forecast model, we don't, don't transmit them. So we do well. And if you look here, at um, this is another example of one of those FSLI plots, which shows you uh, the, the amount of reduction you get in a 24 hour forecast. You can see in this case, this particular um, period, um, which is 2019-01 to 06, so it's half a year. You find the AM, AMVs are up there in terms of contributing to a reduction of error in the um, uh, global model up there with the ASI, the infrared um, hyperspectral and AMSU, the um, microwave sounder. Okay, so that's, that's a bit of a, a rush. It's pretty hard because there's probably 60 or 70 data streams and to go through and analyze them and describe how each one's done. Yeah, you know, I think well, the ones you've seen have been the, the big hitters in the operational system. And I'm just gonna spend a, a couple of minutes now talking about the hyperspectral microwave sounder. And the reason um, I guess I had you know, got interested in this and we started talking to people in the US about this when I was working as director of the Joint Center in the early 2000s. And, at the moment, say you've got a problem where you've got a, a numerical weather prediction system of 1.5 kilometer resolution in forecast, but so, and yeah, maybe three or four in, in analysis, but a very high resolution system. And the moisture structures, say, associated with severe weather, if you want to describe them, put them in the model in the right place, you really have to have a sounder that can do it. And it has to be able to do it. The hyperspectral sounders are now infrared, so with this cloud, you, you know, you stop at the cloud top. The microwave sees through, 
But at the moment, the, the footprints are you know, 20 kilometers you know, of water, whereas this model is sort of down around three or four. So we have to have a, high, a model that can take a, a smaller footprint and say you want something around 10. Um, and you also want it to be accurate. So it, it, with a hyperspectral effect, you get more channels and that becomes more accurate. And it, it's actually got a place in the system already because the high resolution models need microwave data to, to position the, the moisture field for high resolution NW, operational NWP. So the bomb's done a, a, a pre phase A study. Uh, this, you know, I was actually working with it there when this was done. And you know, I sort of put the, uh, even though there are things like the hyperspectral infrared geo orbit, so you can look all the time, there are things we can do, but the hyperspectral microwave is very well suited to Australia because you've got people who work in the HF area. And um, with the processing area, we're, we're quite strong in. And so, so I think that we're, we're well suited to do something in this area and it'd be of great benefit to us operationally. So the, the first study uh, recommend, it was a pre-phase A and recommended a phase A. And there's now another study, pre-phase A study, looking at the, uh, the mission on a slightly broader, um, as a slightly broader sense in terms of um, uh, what size satellite and um, costs and so on. But those are all sort of recommended as it all said it's a good idea. And probably before this started, particularly the last one, um, we had already started to think about how we could build one in Australia, given, as I said, we've got people in Australia and, and we also have friends overseas, but people in Australia who are in the HF area and building this would be, say, easier than an infrared instrument, for instance, which needs an interferometer. And there's no one in Australia that does interferometers. And so it was a it was a, an instrument which had sort of uh, had been called for for quite a while. And so what we what we've got now is works under well uh, underway. Um, um, so we're just start, starting to build the hyperspectral software to find microwave sounder. And the instrument we've got's got the potential to have over a thousand moisture and temperature sensitive or channels, temperature sensitive radians is between 18 and 205 gigahertz at an accuracy and noise level of benefit to operational NWP. Now this is a, a thumbnail diagram of the, the whole system, but basically the um, instruments and added noise uh, total power radiometer and it can be used and you can do RF because you've got continuous uh, spectrum in this, you can do radio frequency uh, interference mitigation too, which is becoming important. Um, so you can see here the millimeter wave signals from the antenna are down converted to the first intermediate frequency. Signal then moves to the uh, analog front end and after digitization to the FPGA for further, further processing. So in there, the parameters such as a central frequency. So this is different than the hardwired microwave uh, systems we have currently. Center frequency, bandwidth, um, in-band ripple, um, out of band rejection, they're all software selected. So the instrument's defined in the software, you can change it and the, you, know, you can actually change it in, in through software. And the, these things are all software selectable and using and it's using a polyphase filter. Now, so the radium design we've got here is scalable. Um, so other frequency bands could be included like um, the 120 gigahertz oxygen band for temperature sounding, uh, and we can go above up, up above to, to um, 40 gigahertz. But basically the design is pretty general. And I guess this end of the this end of the design keeps changing by the week because people keep coming out with cheaper components and, and more components. And um, yeah, and the other the other interesting thing with this, some of this work like with polyphase filters and so on, not only we're designing a system now, but the, the other thing is that there are other people even in this in this building who are actually working in this area too. So it's an area where we've got you know, quite an advantage because of the, uh, the, the breadth of knowledge and, the, and experience. So I've just, look, I've just written down here, I'm not going to um, say any more than, I've just got some characteristics. I guess when you look at things like the inversion software, um, when you build a system like this, you've got to be mindful of 
what radiated transfer codes have the bureaus be using here and what they're using at the, the Joint Center in Washington and so on. So, the, but there are a lot of that software is um, um, available for free. And I think you can't, if you put it in here, you can't sell it. But I think, yeah, we're in a position where we can build an instrument that's um, um, far more powerful than anything that's there at the moment and a benefit to NWP. And also we can build it in a way that easily will interface to other people's um, operational systems. So I think they're the, the key, the, the key um, items you need to address. So I, won't, I won't go through this because it's not... It's just, um, I guess, um, trying to put too much <laughs> in, into one talk. Um, the, the, the hyperspe so I guess the summary for this is, um, these observations, the microwave observations are being promoted by quite a lot of researchers, meteorological agencies and space agencies um, to enhance temperature, moisture and hydrometeor retrieval from space yeah, for operational meteorology and also for research. And, um, and we have noticed the current requirement for enhanced temperature, moisture, and hydrometeor information space for use in operational NWP. So we can sort of satisfy a lot of that by, build, by building an instrument here in Australia. And I think um, here we've described the, the, the hyperspectral software defined microwave radiometer. And it can provide radiances up to a thousand channels for meteorological analysis. Um, the interesting thing is that several people have already approached us and said they would like, like Bill Blackwell wants to look at the data we get, Bill Smith, because there's no, none of this data floating around freely anyway. And it's clearly the next step. I think everyone um, has recognized that. And, and I guess um, we're in a position where our original design has got uh, an ability to do a thousand channels, but I, I guess if you if you want to do it inexpensively, or if you want to do it more expensively, you do want to do it inexpensively. You have to balance. You have to look at uh, how many channels will do the job, and how much power do they require, and how much space on orbit, and all the rest. So it's a it's now a balancing act, but it's getting easier by the day because of the, the capability of these systems and the components are becoming um, more and more powerful. So I think um, with those final words, I think I'll uh, finish up by the old slogan, looking down is looking up. And I'll stop there. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, thank you, John. Um, very informative talk. You took us all the way back to the start and now looking forward. Um, We've got uh, time for a couple of questions. Um, what we'll do is I will ask the ones, uh, if you've got audience here, if you have any questions, just raise our hand, I'll pass you the mic and introduce yourself. And um, we, can, we can do that. And then uh, Paul will do the, uh, the questions for um, the online audience. So maybe the people here, any questions? Any? Uh, um, Anything for me, Peter or Chris? I've, I've, I've got a few questions here. John, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, you made a comment near the end about interferometry. And I'm just wondering about, about interferometers. Yeah. Uh, what additional advantage might you get um, from interferometers? I'm thinking about all the work radio astronomers do with their um, software correlators and so forth. Yeah, I, I think... Um... The advantage, say, in infrared with an interferometer is you get um, uh, how do you think? I think it's it's in, um, they've now moved from spectrometers. To, they started off really in health for an interferometer first. Um, the um, they then moved to a spectrometer airs, then they went back to an interferometer. But I I think. I think the interferometer is easy to build something that gives you radiances that are, you know, low noise and the, the errors are understood pretty completely. I, mean, I think that's the main reason. Um, the, the airs, move, moving airs and putting detectors on positions in, in the instrument itself and so on, 
is difficult, but yeah, I, I think that the, in meteorology for say sounding and infrared, they just moved to interprovenance because they're, I think they're more or less agreed that they're reasonably straightforward to build or reasonably straightforward to build and the accuracy is, uh, does all the things you need. One thing I'd say about this is it, one thing is ever since I was a boy, I've always wanted to actually go away and actually work in um, interferogram space. You have delay and, and the signal, whereas what they do is, you know, the Fourier transform and, and so on. So they're not really, the, the big thing in meteorology when I was a boy was try and work in the most basic um, area you can and, and, and they're not doing that. But I, but I think, yeah, the the problems are here to stay. Thank you. Peter, do you have a question or any anybody else? Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, in the past uh, 10 years, there's two technologies that have really um, come forward. Uh, that's small satellites and uh, machine learning. Um, what was the second one, sorry? Uh, machine learning. Machine learning, yep. Uh, machine learning and AI. Can you just sort of talk about the impact of those two technologies on this, oh. uh, these sounders? Well, I, I think machine learning, look, I, I think I read, the last paper I read in detail with machine learning was a, um, using machine learning to do a forecast, um, trying to get, might've been out to three or four weeks, but I, I think, look, they all have their place because say you're trying to do an analysis now before the data comes in, machine learning can probably do a pretty good job because it's got a lot of the, historic, of the historical record and have a lot of information wrapped up in what you're doing. Um, when you want to do a short-term forecast with um, where you have a lot of me measured variables and it's F equals MA plus a few extra terms um, and you run a forecast, um, you know, it, it's easier then for the uh, quantitative system to do a good job. But I've got no doubt in my mind that the, the, the best solution is going to be using both together because there are elements of the process which always require like the tuning of the infrared, the infrared instruments they use operation now. I'm sure you could do a better job by um, using machine learning. I, th I think what happens is it's sort of obvious in the early, in the early part of the forecast before you have any data, F equals MA and a few other terms can't be used very well because the... Um, you don't have the starting analysis. And so I, I think it's a balance between you know, how accurate the quantitative calculation can do and how much you have to rely on, you know, sort of, um, I guess, previously recorded data. But the answer is both are going to be used for, for quite a while. And I'm sure the answer is a bit like using, uh, what was what I showed there? Um, I guess using radio occultation and spectral soundings, the best answer is using yeah, using both together. Yeah. So, um, Paul, we have, but as uh, Paul, you you read that. I've got one question. Uh, you know, we talked about and 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 people have been asking, you know, about these new models. You know, in your experience, we've been to the US and back and and work in the yeah. bureau. What's the sort of the de decision process to sort of incorporate new instrumentation, new data into our prediction model, uh, how long do, that will take usually, and you know, what's the decision process, um, you know, who makes those final calls or decision? Can oh, this the process insight? for putting data in. Yeah, Pro project putting data in and also, you know, uh, ground truthing it and, and, you know, making it. Well, I guess the, the people who put the instrument together probably do the initial calculation and just ground truthing. If you're lucky, like the position we're in, if we get some data, we have people overseas and around Australia who want to take the data and analyze it for us and help get, get it along the way. Um, the, the process is usually, it depends whether you want to start back having to build the instrument, then get the data and then put in the process you don't usually have to do. But yeah, typically in the US, um, for instance, and that's the typical of, um, the way it's done. It, what happens if, if you get some new data put into the model that has to beat the um, uh, the current model over a, a month period in uh, uh, two different seasons, and it's got to, you've got to make sure it doesn't screw up things like the rainfall, the tropical cyclone forecasts, and so there are a whole list of things you have to go through to make sure that what you got some, an improvement over what you had before. So at least at least a few years, what you're saying. 
Uh, no, I, I think um, no, I, I think you, you can do it. The, the, it depends a little bit on how much of a change it is from what you did before. Like when if Himawari um, if Himawari um, eight, eight, nine comes online as opposed to Himawari eight, the instrument's the same, so it's new data. But people will generate the the observations they compare them to the radio songs and the analyses. And if the error characteristics are similar to the one you had before and it's about to be turned off, you probably do a, a small a smaller test and then move it on. But if it's a radically new um, data set, then um, it you know, just it, it it can vary. But yeah, you know, usually we want to do it as quickly as possible. I mean, and things like ZTD were lucky when we did ZTD. We had the people at um, RMIT and GA and so on doing a lot of the work plus the people in Poland. Mm. And, you know, and with this instrument we're talking about here, it'd be nice that you need to have other people doing a lot of different work that has to be integrated together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Paul? John, we've got a question from Fiona Smith online. Uh, she asks, for the SDMR instrument, do you have any thoughts to push to higher frequencies greater than 200 gigahertz uh, for hydrometeor properties? Uh, there's quite a lot of interest for that. Yeah, the answer, the answer is yes. I guess we've sort of looked at the grant we've got and the money we've got and limited to um, um, what's available easily at the moment in terms of, um, uh, uh, I guess, technology and um, I guess we've just picked the, the area we've done to try and um, you know, get, get something that can be maybe able to use on a satellite with less power availability and also the, the technology is reasonably mature. So I think uh, over 200 we, we mentioned that but we, you know, this, we haven't even done on this mock up here put 118 in because we've got 50 and it's you know I guess we're still in the stage where we're building and paying, paying money for components. Okay. Uh, John, it, yeah, Peter Moore again from Space Instrumentation Engineering Group here at Swinburne. Um, you've had a considerable career there, six decades, so much information to uh, digest in that. Great job in, in compressing all of that. I get the sense that uh, you probably don't sleep and uh, when you do sleep, your brain is processing data and producing most of those charts you, you uh, presented uh, today. Wish I did. Um, one of your roles was quite significant there, Director of NASA, NOAA, and Department of Descent, uh, Defense Joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation in the US. So you, you've worked at the highest levels overseas as well as here in Australia over those six decades. Um, I couldn't help but notice some of your con um, comments about us, you know, world firsts uh, through Australian and Australian researchers and people with the bomb. Um, other than the big difference in budget that the US would get towards solving these problems and, and setting up systems and Australia not having those big budgets, um, um, wh where are Australia's strengths in contributing towards you know, these global challenges um, over your time? Um, where do you see uh, Australia best fitting in? And some of those examples where there were those world firsts in Australia. Yeah, look, I, I think we've always, um, the, the Cloud Rift Winds, we've worked closely with people from Noah Nesdis, uh, Jamie Daniels and another group over there. So we've we decided earlier on, we've tried to keep our wind systems compatible and exchange software and we developed a, an error characterization system and that software went to the US. So we've we worked together because there's really not enough people in either place to sort of do everything you want to do. So, so sh sharing development work and like the UK met on this, the, the um, uh, data assimilation system we use, there's home in there. So again, there's collaboration and collaboration again. Uh, I think um, yeah, and I think this program here, the fact that Bill Blackwell and Bill Smith is the father of the hyperspectral, have already said they're keen to look at the data and Bill Blackwell said he's happy to help out where he can and sort of. So I, I think that sort of environment is pretty common in meteorology. It's been one of the reasons it's um, moved along internationally. 
I think we haven't um, made a space-based contribution. I think, it, um, I think in meteorology, uh, after the focal plane array in AMSA, uh, not AMSA, in the, um, uh, the SST instrument put up by RAL, and the AT, uh, yeah, and so I think um, I think that's something we should be able to use to uh, get some support. I mean, this, this thing, I, I think the, the, the sounder is a good thing for Australia because our NWP and, and satellites are dependent on the satellite data and the satellite data in the region will be certainly improved by having a hyperspectral sounder. And um, it would also be a contribution to, uh, perhaps a contribution to the global NWP system for us to do that. And when I, you saw the benefits before, how we get a bigger benefit than basically all the Northern Hemisphere out of these data, I think it would be a, a good thing and, and a proper thing for us to do. And I think we can do it at a, a reasonable budget. I think sort of you know, the small satellites are the order of a couple of million, but if you want, want to make one big enough to have thousands of channels and make a contribution to the world, you can probably still do that. 70 million, less than 100, 100 million, it's sort of, it's not out of the question. So I think um, it'd be a good path for us to follow. And I think it would um, also give a, a bit of a boost to the local industry. All right. Um, so I would like to bring the uh, talk or event to a close. Um, and I've got a token of appreciation that I'd like to present to, uh, to John. Prof, here uh, we go. This is a, a bit of a uh, memento for you. Uh, thank you very much. Us, uh, yeah. And you're always welcome to, to join our space catch ups. And also, you know, if they want a second talk, you know, please let us know. Yeah. So well, it, it's been a real pleasure for me too. And, and I think um, it's a real opportunity. I think Swinburne has the right sort of things that are needed to put to develop some of these instrumentation for space. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Yes, yes, yes. And hopefully, you know, Peter, you can yeah. uh, lead the charge in the hyperspectra and uh, see if we can see one of them up in the sky very soon. All right, um, please join me to, to again, thank John for uh, the wonderful talk. And then uh, feel free to mingle after this. Uh, those that uh, are joining us online, thank you for staying and thank you for uh, coming to the Space Catch-Up. Hope to catch you face-to-face -face in the next one. See ya. Bye.